Access to quality education is a fundamental human right. It is also critical to meeting the biggest challenges of our time, from eradicating poverty and achieving social justice to fighting climate change and achieving sustainable development. Many Nigerians are being denied this fundamental human right due to the little attention being paid to the education sector. Now, in order to give Nigerians this fundamental human rights, the Nigerian Governors Forum is backing calls for the declaration of a state of emergency in the education sector. And this form the thrust of the discussion uh, this morning, especially on how the state of emergency will bring back the lost glory in Nigeria's education system. Now, joining us this morning to discuss this and more of these issues, we have Mrs. Morenike Adeyinka. She joins us virtually. Uh, she is an educationist, parenting coach, and school administrator. Welcome to Daybreak, Mrs. Morenike. So, first of all, um, a state of emergency on the education sector. Of course, this is not the first time that we've heard, you know, this lingo around the education sector. But then, what are the issues? Insecurity, poverty, dare I say, corruption, and poor funding. Do you think that declaring a state of emergency again on the education sector will help to address some of these issues? Because currently, as we know, um, according to official figures from the uh, UNICEF, I think around 20 million or thereabouts children currently have no access to quality education and schools. Absolutely. Um, good morning and thank you for having me. Um, I want to say yes, um, the state of emergency is, um, is a wake up call for everyone at this time. And um, I believe very strongly that it will move us forward in providing quality education. As you said, UNICEF has declared that about 25 million children uh, are not only out of school uh, in larger parts, uh, but do not have access to quality education. That is, do not have access to education that can inform them, that can help them um, in turn develop the country. So yes, a state of emergency uh, will help. Uh, especially if we do take it seriously this time. Okay, so now the issue of insecurity. Um, when we talk about areas around, say, the northwest and the north central, these areas have been plagued by um, incessant banditry, uh, by activities of kidnappers, and there I see also terrorist activities. Quite recently, we heard of abduction of students from the Federal University in Guso. Now, a similar case happened, you know, some years ago, talking about the Adapchi abduction, uh, the Chibok abductions. Now, what do you think can be done, especially on the part of the government and other stakeholders? Because on one part, we are dealing with a scourge with regards to the uh, number of children that we have out of school. But on the other part, uh, is the psychology that is currently dying among parents, sending their children to school with the fear that they might end up being abducted. Some of these parents, especially in rural communities, now see that it is better to keep their children at home and be safe than send their children to school. So in the interim, while we talk about, um, you know, a state of emergency, what can be done to correct, you know, this narrative and improve on this psychology of sending children to school? Well, I, I think first and foremost, um, parents actually educated. You have to be a firm believer in education to know that, uh, irrespective of what's happening in, and that's not to say those small communities are not important. One life is as important as a as a million. You know, um, parents have to be convinced that, irrespective of what's happening anywhere, um, in any community. Education is still very important. So what that means is that in spite of the news that we're hearing all over the country, um, it's still important to send my child to school. Now, people living in those communities, the government must work uh, towards um, a more lasting solution in providing security for the people, not even just because of education, uh, because you have to feel safe first and foremost in any community that you live in. So, so we must provide some security um, for every household to feel safe in their community. And I, I, I believe with that, parents are able to, to send their children and older children perhaps um, to school. 
and then schools needing um, individualized security operatives can then get those until we are able to resolve the security issue at large, you know, um, nationally. Okay, so um, uh, thank you for joining. Um, I'd like to reiterate the fact that we have myriads of problems facing the education sector in the country. And according to a report from UNESCO, Nigeria, being the most populous nation in Africa, has the, one of the lowest literacy rates in the, in the world. And about 59% of its populace uh, that can read and write. Now, that takes us back to funding. According to UNESCO again, um, the budget, the nation's budget, should um, get uh, education should get about 25 percent, 26 percent thereabout. But we've not been able to achieve that uh, okay. since we've been uh, in the past years, we've been allocating less than 10 percent to education in Nigeria. And I'm thinking that declaring a state of emergency in education now is apt. And now that there's a proposing of the budget of 2024. Now, give us a sense on how this budget, sh uh, the budget of education should look like and how it can impact significantly in education uh, in Nigeria. Um, thank you very much. First and foremost, I think we should, we should prioritize training, training of the practitioner. Um, if you look back at many years ago, um, a graduate of a secondary school was able to teach in the primary school. I, I remember there were modern, modern school teachers, you know, that's what they call them. Um, graduates of colleges of education were able to teach in the secondary school. Um, literacy level was high. People spoke very good English and people could think. And so it was easier to get, uh, the personnel, the practitioners, that knew what they were doing. Now, the level is so low that even teachers in secondary school are not quite equipped. So a lot of the funding should go to training the personnel that we have. Mm -hmm. I would like to say also, maybe retiring a few who are, I mean, the reality is that if you've been, uh, who stayed very long in a system, we're now in the technological age. And uh, if you become, say, a dinosaur and you're unable to fit in, then the next thing would be to leave the system or to retire. You know, so that we do need to take place and um, infuse education with young people who are technologically savvy. And secondly, we do not even have enough schools. Um, so perhaps... Uh, when we say children are out of school, yes, we have that huge number of children out of school. But if we wanted to put them in schools, you know, do we have enough schools? While in certain parts of the country there are empty classrooms, there are many in another side of the country that do not have enough. Hmm. So perhaps we have to look at um, those two would be the most, the highest on my on, on my list. Okay, so uh, some people would say that, you know, having enough schools could be um, could be relative, just like you pointed out. And uh, of course, we have enough schools in some parts of the country, uh, but um, training of yeah. teachers, which you pointed out, is also very important. Now, I'd like to, to give us um, an idea why we're having, you know, teachers who could barely pass the TRC and certif uh, certificate examination are deployed to different classrooms to teach. Why do we have this problem year in, year out? We keep talking about this and churning out people who are not competent to stand in front of a classroom to impact knowledge on these children. Yes, um, I have to say that the system that we currently have has sort of outlived itself. You know, uh, we have teachers in the system who were obsolete even before TRC and became a thing to be, uh, to be judged by, you know. So uh, there, there needs to be an infusion of younger people, um, smarter people who are now technologically serving. I believe that the TRCN 
uh, is starting at a point where uh, it's a system of weeding out, I would say, um, to ensure that people who are only people who are qualified are in the classroom. But we have too many people who honestly are not qualified. You know, so when you are not qualified, you are not up to date, you cannot pass CRCM. You know, because the questions are now um, targeting the 21st century knowledge, which most teachers who have been in the classroom 30 years um, and above, or, or even less, you know, are not able to access. You know, so yes, uh, training is a lot, uh, would impact a lot. You know, a lot of the content that is being required by TRCN are, uh, you know, a lot of teachers are not aware of those things. They haven't been trained a long time in classroom management, in subject knowledge, um, you know, so it will be hard for them to, to be relevant in the expectations of today's teaching and learning process. All right, man. So, um, what other issues are there? Because the issue of qualification is one, but then it doesn't change the fact that despite the fact that the government tries to address the issue of qualification of teachers, there's still a falling standard in Nigeria's education quality. So what are some of the other issues that are contributing you know, to, to this fall? Honestly, um, you know, because most of us live in, in the cities, so we don't, we, we, we're really not aware of what's going on in the in, in the hinterland, you know, um, a lot of these kids have issues like, oh, I haven't had breakfast and then I'm in class. There's very very high rate of poverty, high level of poverty in those places. So even in some areas where you have qualified teachers uh, or teachers who are willing to to do a lot more that is required. Um, to be relevant in the 21st century, there comes in a child who hasn't had breakfast or, or hasn't had anything since yesterday. You know, so he's not going to be learning, uh, no matter what you say at that point. So we have that um, that issue of of poverty, you know, um, that families are experiencing. That's a very huge um, aspect in many areas in the interland. You know, but in the cities where, um, you know, we're able to sort of see, I think it's becoming more relevant to see children on the streets and know, okay, well, what are you doing here? Um, it, it still comes down to poverty, you know, because if we have a household of, of four, we have two parents and two children, for instance, and what the, the father brings home does not feed the family. Um, the mom helps out, the family is still not well fed, of course, they'll throw in the children. Okay. You know, so um, I think poverty is a big, is, is, is a big issue. Okay, it's yeah. interesting to know that you are an educational psychologist and also a school administrator as well as an educationist, which is good. So I'd like to ask you this question now. Um, right now, we have curriculum issues, which a lot of people are not even looking in that direction. And I feel like... It's affecting Absolutely. the impact that we have on these children who have to go through schools from their early life and to the tertiary institutions, which of course is in shambles right now. Give us an idea on how the curriculum can be unified and how an improved curriculum can impact positively in the content of educational materials that is being put out there in schools for usage? Um, I must tell you, the curriculum is not as bad as um, I've heard a lot of practitioners say it is. I'm a curriculum theorist, so I, I see the curriculum across, um, across continents, even the Finnish um, curriculum that we so gallantly talk about. There isn't a lot wrong with our curriculum. The, what is wrong is how we teach it. And um, again, 
a perfect curriculum in the hand of a person who is not trained will be nothing. You know, because you are supposed to, as a teacher, while doing your planning, for instance, you are supposed to go on the internet, connect videos, show children what's been done in other parts of the world, and make your learning inquiry based. So a teacher is not coming to class to inform the children. You are, you are, you are coming to class to inspire the children to find out. You know, so it's more of the strategies you know, that we use in delivering the curriculum that is missing. And a huge part of that is monitoring. You know, I do not like to talk about um, other countries, um, but I, I, I like to reference the UK, for instance. There's a lot about um, inspections. You know, it's a big deal. Um, a parent will look up your inspection rating before they bring your, their child to your school. So if you are an, an inadequate school or you're just a satisfactory school, um, you won't get as many children, you won't get as much money, uh, as much funding, you won't, you know, and the government can come in and say, okay, this is an inadequate school. Um, we're taking this over for, 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 for um, overhauling, you know. So it's the monitoring, um, the, the, the government going into classes, even in private schools, to ensure that People are teaching the way they should be teaching, that the environment looks the way it should look so that children can learn. Teachers are doing, teaching and learning is going on at a very high level, mm. you know. So if we're able to do that, deliver, look at most of the teachers that we have going abroad now and all of that. Um, they, 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 they're conforming to the standards required of them, you know. So if we require those standards of teaching, from our teachers, we would get about the same results. All right. Now, state governors have backed the declaration of a state of emergency on the education sector. One would expect that um, some plans would be reeled out, which would be followed, you know, to the latter to ensure that the education sector is back on track. Can you tell us some of your expectations with regards to this call and the expected outcome of this call? Yes, I think that um, my first and foremost uh, um, expectation will be educating the masses, educators on precisely what you are doing, you know, so that um, the practitioners in the sector, I as a school owner, I as a teacher, I as, um, you know, whatever I am in the education sector, I know what you expect of me, you know, a, a, a national orientation of what you want us to do very clearly and how you want to monitor us, you know, and, and standardization of the expectation and the monitoring. So, um, what you are expecting of me in, in Lagos, for instance, should not be different from what you are expecting of me in, in Abuja, you know, or in National Iowa State or in the States. You know, so it, 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 it's very clear what um, what, the, what the plans are and what you want people to do. You know, and I, I believe that if that is done, if, for instance, I lay my hands on what the expectations are and I know I will be inspected, I have to spring into action to make sure that my school complies with everything. If, I mean, as soon as I know that there's no, there's no getting away. Even as a public school head, I would make sure that my school complies with everything um, that, have, that, that has been expected of me. And I think at the end of the day, the standards of education will be higher because, like I said, that means that they will be very clear about their, about their plans for training. You know, perhaps we would have training schools um, uh, are more accessible with more relevant training content, you know, so there would be compulsory um, training schedule. So every teacher should attend a certain training, for instance, maybe a training on teaching and learning or a training on use of resources, you know, those must be compulsory. And then you can have optional trainings where um, if I see myself weak in maybe classroom management, that can be optional. 
you know, that I go for, I, I do self-assessment and I think so. Uh, there should be very clear, um, um, you know, pathway for training and um, the funding that will go to each area. They also have to be very transparent. Uh, as, as public schools, you have to know how much money you have as a school. Say I am a, I mean, my summer secondary school, for instance. How much money do I have? You know, this session, for instance, to be able to prioritize what my community, my school community needs. You know, um, if I have a million naira, for instance, how much can I spend of that on teacher training, on infrastructure development? If um, I'm in charge of that, so they they have to be very transparent. You know, what we've had in the past is everyone is in the dark. You know, except the people sitting at the table. The, the, the teachers are in the dark. They don't know what's going on. The heads of, um, uh, of the, of the public schools. The people, the only people who know what's going on are the people at the ministry. Hmm. All right. So, know, so, uh, we, we I see all of this play out. And, um, out. you know, when we ask the questions, we always, um, get questions or get answers rather, uh, like, this comes from the ministry, just like you just ended your answer right now, your statement. It comes from the ministry, uh, the education sector and the budget is getting less than 10%. So how do you think that that will reflect in the educational system and the country? Uh, like I said before, the budget uh, has been proposed and we're expecting the government to actually increase the education uh, budgetary allocation for education in this budget but let's streamline it now because we have the public schools and we have the private schools and most of these things rub off in uh, or on the, the the public schools now the private school now which we have a lot of uh, which we can say that it has complemented the public schools significantly over the years now if we are to do something that would impact positively on the lives of the children the private school of course has to be put in place it, it, things have to be put in place now what do you expect there's an economic crunch right now we all know that so how can these private schools um be able to strike a balance between not asking for exorbitant fees and also impacting the right kind of education in the lives of uh, children Well, I think the, the, um, because private education is an investment for, for, you know, the investor, if you like. Uh, the most relevant thing the government can do, perhaps, um, in, in government, um, maybe providing loans at very low rates, uh, because there's only so much you can do. Um, for for an investment because my school is my investment even though um, we're complementing what the, the government should be doing but the focus I must tell you must be on the public system that's 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 the only way all the exorbitant um, cost of education can 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 go down if you remember the um, specific relevance to Rwanda. A lot of public schools closed, I mean, private schools closed down when the government focused on public education. Because if public schools are good, why do I have to go and pay so much, you know, um, for a private education that I cannot afford? You know, so if a lot of focus is placed on the public schools, we will return to the public school. So our private schools will be for people who can truly afford it. Hmm. You know, so I would say um, the only way that the government should support um, private education would be access to low interest um, funding in terms of loans and perhaps some tax rebates, you know, where gov the government agencies that uh, uh, that harass us, harass us a little less. 
All right then, uh, Mrs. Morinike, we want to thank you so much for joining us on a daybreak this morning. It's been quite an educative thank and informative so conversation with you. Of course, being an educationist, I'm not surprised. Um, hopefully, we'll bring you back on the program to talk, uh, you know, evaluation of the decision of the government to declare a state of emergency on education and we do hope for our sake and for the sake of our children uh, that this turns out to be the best and the best comes out of it thank you so much for joining the program thank you very much for having me enjoy the rest of the day